Welcome, Space Club, to our virtual Space Club career. And I'm hearing a an echo. <laughs> it's a great way to start, isn't it? How are you doing, Aspen? Oh, there you go. Welcome back, Natasha. <laughs> How's everything going? Going great. So excited for our last, and so sad too, for our last Space Club career chat, but we're so excited to bring you our guest today. All right, so all the students should know who we have today because you've been asking lots mm -hmm. of great questions. You've read her bio, but as a reminder, we have Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. She is a retired NASA astronaut and professor of aerospace engineering at Texas A&M University. Her education background, master's and bachelor's in ceramic engineering from the University of Washington and a PhD in mechanical biomedical engineering from the University of Houston. And of course, she has been in space, flown five times on the space shuttle, logging 50 plus days in space. And there was a lot of questions about that. We are very excited. And so let me go ahead and bring uh, Dr. Dunbar. Welcome. Thank you. Well, it is great to have you. Um, and before we get to all the questions, and let me stay real quick. I know students are also excited about the raffle prizes. Those are coming at the end, so stay tuned. Um, but we have a lot of great questions from our students. But first, I wanna just give you a chance to share your story and talk a little bit about yourself before we jump into those. So I am bringing the stage to you. I'm gonna add your presentation here. Just give me a second. There we go. Well, thank you. Just uh, give you a brief snapshot of my life and might even answer some of the questions along the way. But I'd like you to kind of think a, a little bit differently about uh, you know the world. I call it thinking outside the sphere as opposed to thinking outside the box. Oops, went the wrong way. Uh, my grandparents uh, immigrated to this country from Scotland, so I'm sort of a second generation American. But we're all immigrants, one, immigrants one way or the other. You know, history is one of my favorite topics, and I don't mean just uh, modern history, but I mean the history of the world, because I'm an astronaut. You know, we learned that the Earth is four and a half billion years old. So growing up in uh, Washington State, uh, my grandparents homesteaded in, in Oregon. It's where my dad grew up, but I grew up in a very rural area. Uh, so oldest of four kids, get here. Uh, if you don't know where Washington State is, it's that northwest corner of our nation and the Yakima Valley is a very small place uh, in central southern uh, Washington. Uh, I grew up with mountains around me and fields and agriculture and the nearest post office was about uh, 50 miles, 15 miles away. It still looks the same way now as it did then. And of course, uh, all astronauts start as kids, <laughs> you know, so I often get asked that question, you know, what, what, how did you get along this uh, pathway to being an astronaut? Well, it starts when you're young and, and, and being curious. And I was very curious. And my parents also uh, were very uh, good about teaching me a little bit about life and about reading in particular. Uh, my, my dad uh, was uh, particularly interested in survival. He'd been uh, a veteran of World War II, so he taught us how to survive in this environment where we were very isolated out in the sagebrush lands of the Yakima Valley. And this is me uh, on his favorite bull as I was growing up. A lot of uh, teachers will say, you know, well, geez, did your mother, was your mother horrified? And well, actually, no, because uh, she took the picture. <laughs> There's not a lot of people out there. So I learned to take some calculated risks. This, this particular bull was like a little puppy dog. And of course my dad was holding me on it. So I grew up on the Diamond Double Ranch with uh, two younger brothers and a sister who came uh, 10 years uh, later. I learned a lot about nature and animals uh, and survival and what makes life tick. And then I also watched all the stars at night. I raised horses and, and steers in 4-H, participated in rodeos and, and state fairs. But just as importantly is I read, and I read about Flash Gordon, uh, watched uh, Sputnik when it was launched in 1957, loved science fiction, so I read Jules Verne, From the Earth to the Moon. And then when Alan Shepard was launched in 1961, the whole world was watching. And then later, John Glenn orbited the Earth uh, in 1952, yeah, I'm sorry, 62. And then later he flew on the shuttle when he was 77 years old. So I still look at that as a career goal. We listened on the radio when President Kennedy committed the nation to the moon. And it was really an exciting time. I was only in junior high at the time. 
but everybody was looking at the stars and space exploration and there were uh, funds to come in and stimulate science and engineering and math. And in fact, that's part of how I, I went on this pathway. I was very interested in space exploration. So I asked my eighth grade teacher what I should take after I graduated from the eighth grade because I had to take another bus into high school. And he said, we'll take algebra. And I said, what's that? And he said, trust me. But that was my magic word because algebra led to geometry and trigonometry and math analysis and chemistry and physics and biology. So when I was accepted to the University of Washington to, under uh, grants and loans and, and scholarships, I needed to, um, to know what to major in. And it was my physics teacher, Mr. Anderson, who said, I think you should become an engineer. Uh, I loved physics. I loved math. But I also took two years of Latin and I was a cheerleader. Uh, you know, we believed in having well-rounded backgrounds, loved to write. And I entered the University of Washington in engineering and then I met my department chair, Dr. James I. Muller. And he promised if I went into his department that he was working on the space shuttle at the time in research, uh, he would introduce me to NASA engineers. And he sure did. And he was, he was a lifelong mentor to me. While I was undergraduate, we did watch the first humans, uh, man land on the moon and altogether 12 men have walked on the moon and we saw our planet for the first time from the surface of the moon, uh, really fully understanding uh, that there's a great big universe out there. I was able to work on the shuttle myself. It led to my first job on this brand new spaceship uh, that launched like a rocket and orbited the earth up to 13, 14 days, and then landed like an airplane. And I worked on the materials that protected it from the high heat of reentry, about 23 to 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was that opportunity that led me to my, my first real aerospace job at Rockwell International in California, working on the shell, on the uh, tiles. And I also applied to be an astronaut for the first time. And the company was so supportive. Uh, this was back in 1976, 78. They put a feature in the local newspaper, the company newspaper. I applied. I was one of the 100 finalists, but I wasn't selected for the, the uh, 1978 class. But I wasn't deterred. I went to work for NASA as a flight controller and then was selected for the 1980 class. So this is my, my 1980 class. I watched as the first shuttle flew, the Columbia uh, shuttle flew in 1981, and I was so proud that I, I was an engineer on that, on that vehicle and to watch it so successfully launch and, and have a 30-year lifetime was in, incredibly um, rewarding. I had the opportunity to fly on the shuttle and just to remind you what it'll look like. It's a space plane with a big cargo, so we did many things in those 135 flights, including assemble the International Space Station and replace instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope. So my first flight was in 85 with seven crew members. It was international. I trained part of the time in Germany with uh, three of my European counterparts. I operated the robotic arm, which brought back the long duration exposure facility in 1990. In 1992, I was the com payload commander on Columbia. It was actually my second flight on Columbia, the vehicle that I had an opportunity to help design and build. And there we had a laboratory in the payload bay and we conducted experiments for 13 days, microgravity research, and you're probably already studying that. In 1995, I was on the first docking mission between the Russian space station and the, and the Mir and the shuttle. I trained in Russia for about 13 months. Uh, that set our record then that was just recently broken. We had 10 people in orbit at one time. Of course, the Mir is no longer in Earth orbit. We docked to it uh, nine times. I was actually on the eighth docking flight to that. And we learned to work together. And out of that came the International Space Station. So a co combination of astronauts and cosmonauts helped to lead to this magnificent orbiting laboratory that now includes Japan, uh, Canada, and the European Space Agency. We continue to do science on board the station that we started back in Skylab on our first uh, space station and up through shuttle through many, many disciplines. And I continue to work with students uh, here at the university. I'm a professor of aerospace university at Texas A&M, but throughout my career, I've, I've worked with high school as well as uh, elementary and middle school students to try to inspire them into 
studying math and science, uh, as well as to go into careers that support exploration. Uh, my lab here has graduate students and students in it designing spacesuits, as well as being involved in fluid physics research in microgravity environments. As we all know, we're going back to the moon. How exciting. In your lifetime, we'll probably see uh, bases like we have at Antarctica and many nations involved. And in fact, our first mission, as you know, is on the calendar. It's the Artemis mission. We hope to be there by 2024, maybe a couple years later, but it's definitely going to be in your lifetime and you may be a part of it in the future. And that is our proving ground. Once we learn how to work, live, gather the research we need for partial gravity environments, then we'll go on to Mars, possibly as early as 2035. And then in your lifetimes, you will see uh, people traveling to Mars and on the basis there as we explore the universe. We continue to select astronauts. Uh, this is the class of 2017. They'll be part of that uh, lunar mission. Uh, it's an exciting time uh, to be part of space. And so with that, uh, I will close and open for questions. Thank you. In questions, we got a lot submitted. So can you hear me? All right. So our first question is, what inspired you to be an astronaut from SJA North Stars in Maryland? Well, you know, it's hard, hard to, to tell exactly, uh, but it was very, I was very young, probably nine or 10. And it might have been just being out in the, under the clear skies, being able to see the Milky Way and asking what that was before I went to school. What's that stripe of stars out there? Uh, reading science fiction, finally getting our first TV a little bit later and black and white, but watching Flash Gordon. But most certainly it was definitely uh, when the nation decided to go to the moon. We had one TV channel in the Yakima Valley and every night we listened to Walter Cronkite give us an update on the, the moon missions. We heard from NASA engineers and universities talking about all the great opportunities and challenges. And that was exciting. Uh, fortunately, I had teachers that helped me I identify the classes I needed in school to be able to follow the career path that I needed to have to become an astronaut. Yeah, I think it's so great to you know rely on your support system to get you know to you know to where you want to go. All right, our next question is from Southern Space Girls in Mississippi. What was the most challenging part of engineering? Um, you know, if you like something and you're excited about it, because engineering is uh, is is not making a light bulb every day. Engineering is about uh, solving the unknown. Okay, science, you learn the rules. You know, you learn that water is H2O. But engineering is about uh, inventing the future. And so that's what I liked. It's so creative. Uh, you have to have the tool set. You know, you have to have the mathematics, the physics, the chemistry. And you bring it all together and you can change the world. You can change the quality of life. You can invent rockets. Uh, it's, it's really about moving forward with civilization. Yeah, potential is un unlimited. So, all right, Natasha, you're going to take the next set of questions. All right, so this next part is on your training to become an astronaut. So. How do you feel when you, I guess, get that final, you are an official NASA astronaut from Zenith Vipers in New Jersey? Well, of course I was elated because I tried once before, but I've never been detoured. You know, something I learned from my parents. Uh, I started riding a horse before I could walk. They wrote me to the horse and we go on horseback rides. And if you fell off the horse, you always got back on. And if you didn't succeed the first time, you found out why you didn't succeed. So when I, I wrote to NASA after I wasn't selected the first time and asked them what I needed to do. And for those early classes, they really wanted you to have a, a doctoral degree. It was very, very competitive if you were a civilian. So I did go back to graduate school uh, while I was working full time. So I, I joked I didn't have a life, but it was all worth it. <laughs> you know, if I wasn't, wasn't working full time, then, then I was in the laboratory and weekends and evenings. Uh, so the second time, I was pretty happy <laughs> that I was selected. Were you at all like, oh, no, what did I get myself into? Or was it just pure excitement? No, I, I knew full well. I'd read about this since I was a kid. You know, I, I uh, read the biographies. I wanted desperately to be able to fly an airplane. I, I didn't uh, get my private pilot's license until I went to work for Rockwell when I could afford it. But I'd always look up at the contrails, the planes. I'd Stay, sneak out of bed at night to watch uh, 
the uh, the TV stations close off with high flight with the jet flight jet fighters flying through the clouds. I just knew that's something I wanted to do. That's awesome. While training, what is one task that was more difficult than the rest? So ah. we Nevada and we have a video playing here. <laughs> well, it wasn't the EVA, I'll tell you, the extracurricular yeah. activity. Uh, that's amazing. You have to share that, that clip. I don't have that. Uh, but uh, it was when I was assigned to Russia for the first crew to train with um, the cosmonauts for the Mir uh, mission, which, you know, we hadn't flown with them since Apollo Soy Soyuz in the 1970s. Uh, so I'd already flown, uh, you know, three times. I was, I was experienced in flight. I understood the research and the experiments and obviously the physics, but I had to do it all in Russian. And I was in my 40s. So I'd say the hardest thing I ever had to do was to learn Russian and converse in Russian and train in Russian uh, at and when when I was I thought I was past the age of learning a new language, but immersion works. They didn't allow English, and after six months, you're starting to think in Russian. Can you tell us something in Russian? Добрый день, как дела, хорошо. You know what? Do you know? <laughs> great. I don't know what that. <laughs> I just said, you know, good day, hello, yeah. how are you? <laughs> I love it. Okay, how do you feel when you first went on the space shuttle? Were you nervous or excited? I'm gonna guess you were excited. Um, from Space Cadets in Mississippi. Well, you know, it's, it's sort of like, like flying an airplane or an automobile though. You may be excited, but when you finally are in the vehicle, you want to be focused on what you're doing because any errors can be catastrophic, right? You want your airline pilot to be focused on flying the airplane. So while we were excited, and by that time I'd been training for years, so it wasn't, a question of being nervous it's you we were as familiar with the shuttle as if you're old enough to drive a car you become familiar with your car or your bicycle whatever you're riding because uh, each can hurt you but so it, it was a combination of being excited but really always trying to stay one step ahead of what's happening so you're safe uh, I wasn't I wasn't truly excited till I was back on the ground and would, could watch my flight films <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna talk about life in space and what that was like. So our question from the Astros in Florida was, how was it spending more than 50 days in space and what did you do to keep sane? Oh, well, I, I try to be sane all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 50 days were spread through five missions. I had five great crews. Of course, we trained a minimum for each flight a year together. Our families knew each oh. other. We socialized together. Uh, on breaks, we looked out the window. We were busy working. We had what was called a flight plan that would schedule each of us within you know, five minute increments because the research we did was not ours. It, it was research being conducted by industry, by government, and by university students and even middle school students. So we were there hands, eyes, and ears out in this remote laboratory. So we couldn't fall down on the job. I always looked at, you know, I better succeed at this uh, or somebody's going to fail on the ground. So uh, I always stayed sane. It was very stimulating and exciting. Yeah. Was there anything that surprised you about living in the ISS or anything unexpected or? Uh, well, this is a real tribute to uh, our um, mission operations folks at the Johnson Space Center and their trainers in that they train you to, except for the weightless environment, a very high mm -hmm. fidelity environment. So your trainers look like the vehicles. Uh, we, we even had a simulator for the shuttle that was motion would you know, shake and rattle and launch and, and land. So there, there weren't too many surprises. It, it's always a welcome, uh, I guess, exposure to, to microgravity or zero gravity because we, we can't really simulate that for extended times on the surface of the earth just for in parabolic aircraft for 20 seconds at a time. Uh, so I always enjoyed that. I always enjoyed being weightless, but no significant surprises, but that's really a tribute to our trainers. Yeah. And then from Neptune Spirit in Wisconsin, what was it like to eat in space? And did you have like a favorite food that you enjoyed up there? Well, I think I ate better uh, out of our, <laughs> our food stuff uh, than in, in, on the shuttle because of the dietitian who transformed foods for the space shuttle by the name of Rita Rapp. And uh, Dr. I think our uh, dietary labs, uh, food labs are named after her. Uh, 
but everything was uh, all tested in the labs. We tested it before we went. It's not not squishy, add water <laughs> type of foods, uh, dehydrated, thermostabilized, irradiated. So uh, we had, you know, uh, soups and oatmeal and we had salmon and beef. And but my favorite uh, rehydratable food was shrimp cocktail with horseradish uh, sauce, which mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed. Yeah. All right. So what was the coolest thing you saw in space from supernovas in Michigan? Well, that's a great uh, name, supernovas. <laughs> uh, I think on my first flight, I'll never forget, we were on a very high inclination orbit. That's the angle you make between the equator and your pathway. So it was 57 degrees. We didn't have many of those high inclination orbits. That means you see 57 uh, north latitude and 57 south latitude for those of you studying orbital mechanics and, and orbits. And that gave us a great slant view to Antarctica. And we had one particular orbit, we call a pass, where we were in the dark, but we could see the southern lights, the aurora australis over Antarctica. And of course, it looks just like it's burning. You can download those uh, images now on, on the North Pole, as a matter of fact. And it was just a really spectacular sight. We were all looking out the windows. We we're facing the direction we were going. I felt like we were on the, uh, you know, Starship Enterprise <laughs> on the command deck. And, you know, here's this planet below us and these, you know, auroras off to the right. So it's a particularly amazing sight. Yeah. Oh, that sounds so cool. I can I can imagine what that, what that would be like to look at. All right. What was your favorite NASA mission you went on from the eclipse in Arkansas? Well, all five were great. That's like asking what your favorite child is. You can <laughs> uh, All of those missions were really outstanding, had great opportunities on those missions, great crew members, and all very successful missions. So it'd be hard, hard to pick. <laughs> all right. The next question from uh, the three space tiers in Minnesota was, so a lot of our students are wanting to maybe be an astronaut someday. So what can they do now to prepare if they want to be astronauts when they get older? Well, first of all, stay healthy. Definitely don't do drugs. Eat well and, and exercise. You don't have to you know, bench press 500 pounds, but you have to be cardiovascularly healthy. And this starts while you're young. Okay, so don't be too sedentary. Get involved in sports. Sports is not just a math met method of being healthy. It also gives you an opportunity to learn how to work as part of a team. And to be an astronaut, NASA wants to ensure that you're also a team player. Then the rest is academic preparation. We select engineers, all kinds of engineers, all kinds of scientists, and physicians. So medical background, engineering, and science. And what I suggest to prospective young astronauts is to go online and look at all the variety of different biographies because our astronauts come from all walks of life. Uh, you know, when I came into the office, about 50% of us were from rural areas, we grew up in farms, and you know, uh, many of us went through engineering. Uh, but I, part of it's just being prepared academically, uh, as well as um, these what we call soft skills, teaming, for example. Uh, we, we really encourage our astronauts to be well-rounded, you know, so have other hobbies <laughs> involved as well. And set goals, work hard, and have a good attitude. Awesome. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so our last um, part of these questions is your work now. As a professor, you mentioned um, aerospace engineering at Texas A&M. And so the students at Perry Central Mississippi want to know what projects are you working on at this moment? And we did pull some of your um, the highlights that we found, but you, what are you working on? Well, of course, I'm working through my graduate students. I have both master's students and PhD students, and I have undergraduates working in my lab as well. Uh, right now, we're trying to do some modeling on EVA suit um, uh, parts of the suit because it's pressurized. There's, uh, you're going to mostly vacuum environments, so your suit's kind of inflated. We're trying to do some design optimization with the computer. It's called finite element analysis. And then we're trying to also understand how liquids or fluids behave in partial gravity. In zero gravity, they create a sphere. In one gravity on Earth, it may be you know, wet or not wet, but, but you pour it out, it's gonna fall down. The moon is only one sixth of our gravity and Mars is three-eighths of that gravity. And how fluids behave 
in gravitational environments is really important because it affects what we call heat and mass transfer. Our weather is due to convection. Hot air goes up, cold air comes down. Boiling is, you know, hot liquid goes up, cold liquid comes down. That rate of change is dependent on the gravitational level, but we don't have any data between microgravity now in the space station and earth gravity. We need to understand that to be able to develop things like life support systems and spacesuits for uh, future exploration. Hmm. That's really interesting. All right, so Aspen, last part. All right, so we're gonna do our rapid fire questions. So what this means, Dr. Dunbar, is that you will be given five questions and you will have 60 seconds to answer <laughs> each question. All right, so it's the first thing, whatever comes off the top of your head, the first thing you think of. So Dr. Dunbar, are you ready to play rapid fire questions? Certainly. All right, let's do this. So our first question is, is zero gravity as fun as everyone thinks and says it is? Yes. <laughs> All right, next question is, how would you describe Earth when you first see it from above? Well, I'll copy a phrase, the big blue marble. Awesome. All right, our next question is, what are some of your hobbies? Uh, well, my hobbies have included, uh, when I could, play baseball, but climbing, hiking, skiing, uh, reading, and playing the piano. Awesome. All right, what is your best memory with NASA? Oh, being part of my, my 1980 class and all the things we did together uh, and all my crews. Uh, are you still in contact with anybody from your mission? Oh, yeah. yeah, we have reunions. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. And our last but not least question is, what is the most important thing you learned while working at for NASA? Always try to work with creative people. That's what NASA is all about. Energetic serve your nation and think about the future. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna pull up um, one of our questions that we've gotten while you've been talking. Okay. And so we have a student ask, I wonder if there has been any mistakes or malfunctions during her days of being an astronaut? Well, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate there was no major malfunctions. The shuttle um, worked beautifully. Uh, you know, during the 100 and uh, the 30 years, 135 flights we had, we obviously lost uh, two vehicles. And that was due to the launch part of the system, not the shuttle itself. So we had a, a problem with uh, O-rings on the solid rocket booster, which is part of the launch, and some problem with some insulation falling off the external tank that holds the liquid hydrogen and oxygen. But the shuttle itself performed beautifully, and it performed beautifully in all my flights. So that would act as a malfunction. There have been uh, sometimes people make errors on, you know, switches and experiments, and we've seen our share of them, but we always uh, recovered, and uh, we always provide for that, uh, always we call it contingency operations in flight. Awesome. Well, it has been a real pleasure having you um, as part of our final Space Club career chats. Do you have any final words that you want to share with our elementary and middle school kids watching? Uh, yeah, I wish I, I could see you. It's, it's uh, always uh, easier and better for me to be able to make that eye contact with you. I, I think the advice I'd give you is that your dreams are all valid. It's just a matter of uh, being able to uh, find those people who tell you, help you with that pathway. Always articulate where you want to go and then find those things that make it a joy to get up in the morning and then it's not work. I love that. All right, well, thank you very much. And we're gonna say goodbye to you now. And we're going to move on to the last part. Are you ready for this? Let's do this. All right. So before we get to raffle prizes, we need to share a highlights video. So the last mission that you just completed, the deadline was yesterday, was to design a lunar base. So you've been doing different missions every week, but this big one was the final project was how do you keep humans alive. So you thought about food and energy and water, but also happy. So the mental health. So let's check out some of the designs.
All right, so those were incredible designs. We have been really impressed with all the work of the students and especially this final lunar base. Some of those designs are so intricate and detailed. I mean, just incredible. And so what we've done for our raffle prizes, now this is gonna take us a few minutes because we have a lot of stuff to give away, which is great. Um, so first, what we have is the teams that were just featured, not just from that video, but any team that completed the final mission. So if you submitted your engineering challenge for mission nine, we've put you in the raffle and you have the chance to win astronaut ice cream and this really cool solar robot. And it's really cool with the solar robot. You can customize it, race with your friends. And so let's see who won. All right, so here are my teams. <laughs> and the winner is Andromeda in New York. Congratulations. And we'll be contacting all of y'all tomorrow on how to get the prizes to you. All right. So the next prize is something different. Um, this is actually a prize for the teachers. So if there's any teachers out there watching, we have a special prize for Space Club teachers. We had a request if anybody wanted to send us a video for feedback and we put all of those names of teachers in a raffle and we are gonna give you a $50 gift card for some Space Club swag, whether a cup or a mug or a shirt or whatever it is you want. Yeah, and we so we just opened our Zazzle shop and so if you're wanting any sort of Space Club swag, you will be getting this from this raffle. So let's spin that wheel, Natasha. So for our Space Club teachers. All right, and congratulations to Scholars Academy. I know she is watching, so congratulations. And again, we'll be emailing for all the prize winners today. We'll be emailing you tomorrow. <laughs> okay, and now this is also something different. We asked our those Space Club teachers, are there any students that just stand out, that have just gone above and beyond, have been participating in every mission, doing the submissions, are a team player, a leader, and we got back an overwhelming number of nominations. And we just wanna do a shout out to those students that teachers feel deserve some extra recognition. And we're gonna have a special drawing just for those students. So this is an individual prize. I'm gonna read some names here. All those names are gonna go in the next raffle and two of those students are gonna win one of these prizes here. So let me go, there's a lot. So first we have Mills Perry Central High School, Lola Benton Stem Elementary, Brennan Bloom Carroll Middle, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your names, Karen State Line Space Patrol, that's Garen, sorry. Sophia Mountaintop Space Club, Reginald Henrico Police Athletic League, Jonathan, Redland Christian Academy. Case, Seely Elementary School. Alyssa, Olive. Rylan from Riverview Elementary. Crystal, Newhall Elementary. Lorena from Scholars Academy. Spencer from Fox River Academy. Olivia from Calvary Christian School. Achmia? St. Paul Lutheran School. Elvin from Christ the Teacher Academy. Xander from Broadway Elementary School. Yasmin from Harlandale ISD. Nicholas, Newville Elementary School. I told you there were a lot, right, Aspen? <laughs> uh, Knowlton from Gizmo. Kyler from Washington Fields Intermediate School. Isha from Faiz Middle School. Zoe from Jimacum Elementary. Marcus from McAuliffe IS 187. Sydney from Stanhope's Valley Road School. Juliet from Valley Academy of Learning. And those are the students. All right, I got through it. <laughs> okay, so from all those students, I put you in a raffle and you will have the option to win. Ask them, tell them what they're winning. All right, so you have the choice between a really cool drone that you can attach your phone to and actually see the footage from your drone on your cell phone. How cool is that? And then the second prize is a super cool telescope that you can also attach your cell phone to and see the planets galore so that you too can prepare to be an astronaut someday. All right, let's see who our first winner is.
All right, our first winner is Elvin from Christ the Teacher Academy. Congratulations. And then our second student. All right, and our second winner is Lorena from Scholars Academy. So congratulations. Again, we'll be emailing your teachers tomorrow. Okay, whew. so now we are at the end. This is our final grand prize that we have been promising. Now here's what happened. Any school that had a team that got at least 25,000 points in Goose Chase has been entered in this final raffle. So we're like, what do we give these schools? We could do a 3D printer, we could give them model rockets, we can give them robots, technology. There's so much stuff that we can give you we're like, maybe they just want to pick. Maybe they want to decide what they want. So three schools from this raffle are going to get a $450 gift card to Stemfinity, which is like a one-stop STEM shop. Tell them, Aspen. Yeah, and so you guys are going to be able, again, choose whatever you want for up to $450. You're going to get the gift card. Use it how you want. They have robots that you can program. They have 3D printers. So it's really whatever your, you and your school needs, you can purchase with this gift card. So let's see who our first school winner is. I'm so excited. All right, and our first school winner, congratulations to Oakland Middle School. And then our second winner is Valley Academy of Learning. And then last but not least, our third and last raffle prize of the day Woo! is All right, congratulations to Liberty Center Schools in Ohio. Again, we'll be contacting you tomorrow. That's it. We did it. We have made it <laughs> to the end of the Mission to Moon. If you are on the Goose Chase app, we're going to leave it open for a couple of days through May 14th. Uh, so you have two more days if you just want to check out all the other submissions. But it has been a pleasure working with all the students out there. We've loved seeing your submissions every week. Thank you for joining us on the Space Club Career Chats. And we hope you guys have a great end of the school year and a wonderful summer. And maybe we'll see you at a future mission. Yeah, thanks, guys.